just to uh, just kick things off in terms of the panelists, we do have uh, a number of uh, very established and well-recognized individuals who will be presenting today. So um, joining me after my short overview will be Anthony Brown, who's the CEO of AMP Technology. Uh, we also have Roy Chartier, who's the founder of Cancer Compute, which is a, a great organization doing some really good, good work out there. And then we also have Mark Dam, who's the CTO and CEO of Fuse Forward. So uh, I think uh, a, a really good set of individuals who are uh, extremely knowledgeable about the industry. So welcome. So to kick things off, uh, I will be giving a quick overview of some of the background behind cloud and uh, high performance compute. And, uh, and our agenda for today is, is really just a, a very brief overview. So why we're here today, uh, a look at some of the, uh, the evolution of CanShield into what we determined as sort of a hybrid cloud environment and what that actually means. Uh, we'll then hear from Ant on high performance computing at the edge for industry 4.0, which is a really interesting uh, slide deck and, and some information on, on, on localized compute and what that enables organizations to do. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Cancer Compute and their, their slide deck on computing for the cure, and then Fuse Forward and, uh, and their work with cloud and universities. And, and that's obviously very prevalent with the audience that we have today. <coughs> so I thought it would be prevalent to give everybody a little bit of a base before we jump into some more of the technical things. And so when we're going through this, this is really our overview of, of what a cloud and high performance platform can, can look like. And the cloud and what's that defined as can be a number of different areas. And so when we talk about the cloud, primarily uh, we're, we're looking at delivering compute and services uh, in a virtual uh, uh, framework or internet or, or over the internet, for example. And so, it, you know, uh, it can come in uh, a private cloud solution where you have your own network, which is hosted outside of your facility. Um, you can have it on localized compute. Uh, you can have it with a tier one provider like AWS. And so there's a number of areas that that cloud plays into the market. And then how does high performance compute and what does that imply? And that's really the aggregation and the clustering of on computing power. And where we've seen a, a significant rise in that is because of the, the big problems that we're trying to solve with large data sets. And that's where high performance compute comes into its own because it, it can provide a platform to allow you to, to crunch significant amounts of numbers. So as I said, that's sort of the, uh, our, our definitions, quite broad in scope, um, but hopefully that clears, clears and, and lays some, some um, base work for everybody. So this is, this is really the slide about why we're sort of interested in getting involved in, in this industry. And this information is taken directly from Compute Canada. And I, I want to stipulate that this is not a, a bash at Compute Canada. This is really just an overview of how the industry has evolved rapidly over a number of years. And what you see here is a chart, which is basically the uh, CPU allocation. So uh, cores allocated uh, through Compute Canada and, and their sort of framework. And what you have is a 20% a CAGR, so compounded average growth rate per year. So it's a huge amount of demand that's increasing uh, in just the universities and the institutions and their demand for compute power. And so in four and a half, five years, you basically doubled the demand. And as I mentioned, this is sort of indicative of where uh, the industry is going in terms of requirements for cloud and high performance compute. And so over the last two years, Compute Canada has only been able to fill 40% of total compute requested. And that's the red line uh, that you see on that graph. That indicates the requested uh, core years. And then the blue line is sort of the supply of that. And so as you can see, there's a significant gap. I mean, 60% of institutions and their requirements are not fulfilled uh, through this platform. And then when you start looking at GPU, so graphical processing units and what's required and demanded on that side, well, the number even gets even worse. So there we have 26% of GPU requested that's fulfilled. So 74% of GPU requested is, it goes, goes, goes unfulfilled, which is a significant number. 
And as I said, this is indicative of what we see in a lot of areas and a lot of industries. And this is why CanShield and our partners and the panelists who are presenting today have spent you know, a significant amount of time and effort in trying to address these, these, these areas. So a little, a little overview about CanShield. So we own and operate a 10 and a half thousand square foot facility here in Kamloops. Uh, we have a megawatt of power today. Uh, we have approval for four megawatts. So we, we have everything that is required of a secure data center. And, and importantly, our data center is uh, built specifically for data center requirements. So we're not leasing a space on the floor. Our facility is purpose built. We have capacity for about 200 racks. Uh, or cabinets. Uh, we're very highly connected with 400 strands of fiber and we're uh, located in Kamloops. And so that last point is actually quite significant and I'll explain why. So firstly, uh, why Kamloops? Uh, because of where we sit from a geographical standpoint. So this is a, a map, the seismic map taken from uh, Canada, sort of National Canada uh, guidelines. And as you can see, uh, isolated, the, the red areas uh, isolate very uh, seismically unstable areas, and the blue areas are very seismically stable areas. And so CanShield, from a geographical standpoint, has huge advantages on the West Coast because we fit, sit nicely in interior BC, we're very close to metropolitan areas, and we're on a seismically stable plane. So again, a very significant advantage there. Secondly, Kamloops just so happens to be the crossroads for connectivity uh, in British Columbia. So if you want to transfer data, for example, from anywhere from Victoria, Vancouver to the East Coast, uh, and you want to keep it on Canadian soil and routed, well, it has to go through Kamloops. And if you want to go from Vancouver to Kelowna, again, through Kamloops, or Vancouver to anywhere else in BC, typically you will be going through, through Kamloops. So there's uh, some major advantages there uh, being located and, and situated in Kamloops, which is why our data center is, is, in a, is in a great location for that. Now, what's our evolution as an organization? So uh, initially our facility and our, our, our goal was to provide a co-location facility. So basically clients could onboard. So you as an institution or you as an organization want to house and manage your, your facility and your, your data um, in a secure area while we could provide that. We then uh, looked at offering infrastructure as a service and so that infrastructure as a service uh, provides you the high performance compute that provides you the compute power that to run your applications. We then looked at offering a, a cloud on-ramp solution and that cloud on-ramp on solution looks at providing a private network for you to take advantage of the tier one data centers like AWS uh, etc. And then finally, that brings us nicely to a hybrid cloud environment. And what that implies, where you get localized compute, as well as the advantages of having access to the cloud. And that's sort of our evolution as an organization. And just to drill down on that a little bit further, and what that implies for you as an organization. Well, the localized compute allows you to have increased performance, reduce latency, and uh, manage your costs a lot more significantly than say, if you had everything applied in the cloud. Uh, while the cloud allows you, and what the cloud was designed for, is to provide that elasticity. So as your major compute starts to, to be stretched, you can fall back on the cloud and allow the public cloud, like the AWSs, the Azures, OpenStack solutions, to basically take on that workload that your compute power uh, is struggling with. So that is the design, that is the evolution of CanShield and what we have uh, pushed our organization to, to implement. Now, finally, I just want to touch base on how we have worked with organizations over the last, you know, 6, 12, uh, 18 months on, this, on these type of solutions. And uh, one company that I'd like to, to bring to your attention is Ember Research, and they're a British Columbia organization. They do um, wildland fire management and, and simulations behind that. And so, uh, over the last six months, we've been working with Ember. And Ember have uh, an amazing solution uh, simulating uh, wildfire uh, uh, management uh, software. And they require sort of load balancing uh, infrastructure to basically crunch these numbers and work with large data sets. So 
CanShield was able to deliver uh, a, a sort of a small core count of 224 cores, over 2,000 gigabytes of RAM, and implement that as part of their platform. So over a six month project, they were able to run 200 million sim simulations and run 500,000 ignition locations. So again, a, 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 a quite a, an interesting project. We worked with them on that and we were able to do that from our secure facility in Kamloops. And so again, uh, just talking about the high performance compute and those clusters of computes, well, um, this is a prime example of how we can do it even from a small scale and customize that to, to take it to a much larger scale. Right, so that sort of concludes my overview of, uh, of CanShield and a little bit of background behind cloud and high performance compute and why we are also interested in this organization. Um, it's now, uh, uh, I'm gonna pass on to Anthony uh, and Anthony Brown is the CEO of AMP Technologies, as I mentioned. And a little bit of background behind Anthony, and, and apologies that I don't I have memorized this, but uh, I have been working with Anthony for some time now, and, and uh, what he's doing at AMP Technologies is, uh, is quite an amazing uh, uh, sort of infrastructure play. And so some of the background about Anthony is that um, he is a significant entrepreneur uh, in the digital media and infrastructure, uh, a pioneer in Canada. Um, he founded Ampt in 2015 uh, to combine his experience and passion for technology with the digital media space and high performance computing in both the studio and the data center. Um, as I mentioned, Anthony has a lot of experience in high performance compute and deploying this and is already doing this in a number of locations. And so uh, really interested and very delighted to have Anthony here today to, to go through his, uh, his discussion points. So Anthony. I'll hand it off to you, and if you can uh, share your screen, we'll uh, we'll get going on that front. Well, I'm I'm not sure I'll be able to live up to that uh, uh, to that uh, introduction, but I'll do my best. Uh, oh, it says I cannot start screen share while the other participant is sharing. Okay, there we go. It's all you. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, is that coming across now? Perfect. All set? I will say this is my first webinar, uh, or first time presenting in a webinar. I've done lots of public speaking in the past, but I've, I've never done it without being able to see all the lovely faces staring back at me. So uh, uh, this will be a, a, an interesting first time experience for me. Uh, and thanks very much, George, for setting this up. I, uh, I really uh, enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I think that the, the slide around uh, Compute Canada is very salient. Um, you know, it's really showing kind of how much demand is, is really out there uh, and how capacity is just, not, is just not there to meet that demand yet. Um, so, you know, I have, I have a few slides on the company. I'm going to just kind of plow right through them because I'd like to get to the, to the meat of the matter and talk a little bit more about the, um, about the case studies and about some of the things that we've done. Uh, with regards to high performance computing at the edge and, wh and what we mean by that. Um, <coughs> we do have a digital media background. Uh, I, I uh, started a company called Seven Group uh, way back in 2000. Uh, I, I, I am a, an older kind of, we call it gray tech uh, 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 sort of entrepreneur. Uh, and Seven Group uh, started out actually really focused in the high performance computing for engineering and, and post-secondary research and so on, but we moved into digital media around 2004 and found that a lot of the same workloads for things like render farms and so on applied the same principles as high performance computing. Uh, we got on the other side of the glass and, and uh, actually rolled Seven Group into a new company called Infinite Game Publishing and we published uh, three games. Uh, we were the first AAA uh, video game publisher in Canada. You know, lots of big publishing companies have offices in Canada, uh, but we're the first guys to actually have a AAA publisher that was Canadian based. And then Ampt really benefits from the experience of those two companies in having deployed high performance compute platforms for other companies and then having had to run an esports latency sensitive uh, uh, high performance platform for ourselves. Um, so we are uh, one of the founding members of the Canadian Digital Technology Supercluster. Uh, we, I sit on the board and on the executive committee along with a, a bunch of really great companies. Uh, those board meetings are amazing. It's like sitting at the, uh, at the table of the Illuminati with all these really fantastic companies that are, that are really changing the world of technology. Um, so 
really when you boil down what it is we do uh, is we're going after latency. When we take a look at what the, the, the main differences between HPC uh, and, and what we're trying to provide and kind of the standard hyperscaler uh, Amazons and Azures and so on of the world, uh, uh, the, the main difference boils down to how we are mitigating latency. And we do that kind of for four main verticals. Uh, the multiplayer, video games and esports, animation and visual effects, and that combined gives us our digital media focus. But we're also doing it uh, with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, and data analysis and visualization. And we can give you, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how we do that. But the way we kind of break that out is by first bringing that compute to the edge. So you're not accessing this computing over the internet. You're accessing it via a direct fiber connection. Uh, be it in, and, and generally speaking, we're trying to be as close to that end user as possible to, to mitigate that last mile latency. The other way that we do it is by using an HPC architecture as opposed to a distributed computing architecture, which is generally speaking more along the lines of what the hyperscalers, the large, the large cloud providers provide. Uh, so our first data center, DC1, and yes, you can guess what the second data center is called. Uh, DC2, uh, is, is based over at uh, 1540 West 2nd in the Waterfall Building. And one of the things that we realized was going to be necessary when we're building this type of infrastructure in cities uh, is that, you know, especially when you're dealing with megawatts of power, you've got to look at how you can be a little bit more green. So what we do with our data center is we capture the heat generated by the, by the servers in the data center, uh, and then we also generate clean drinking water off of the condensing systems. Uh, we don't generate very much unless it's an emergency. So in an emergency situation, we can generate up to 1,000 gallons a day uh, just off of our uh, air conditioning systems in DC-1. Uh, and this, uh, that data center currently actually heats the surrounding building. It's called the Waterfall Building over on West 2nd. And the next thing is this, this HPC architecture and what that means. Right? So really, what it boils down to is, number one, it's uh, hardware switched, hardware firewalled architecture. Everything is as, as close to wire speed as we can possibly get it. The next thing is array-based storage, and not just array-based storage, but NVMe fabrics and the latest and greatest in, in both block and file level storage access to uh, get the highest amount of IOPS and the lowest latency, measured in microseconds, not milliseconds. Uh, and in the case of uh, most of the, the larger cloud providers, the storage is w what's referred to as hyperconverged. We have uh, all the data is actually resident in the servers. And so whenever there, a server needs to get data from another server, you're introducing latency. Uh, instances with us are dedicated instances. We don't, we don't do preemptible instances. But in our case, in comparison to Google, Amazon, and Azure, on a per core basis, we're less expensive than a preemptible instance with a dedicated core. Uh, the next thing is the connection, that direct fiber connection that I talked about, and being geographically close to the end user. And then finally, we can build these things bespoke. We can customize the environment to make sure that it actually meets the, the hardware, the, you know, right at the base level, meets the exact requirements of, what, of the job and the compute job we're trying to do. It's bare metal, it's virtualized, it's whatever is required, and it's, and it's the type of, of gear that's required to be able to be the most efficient uh, to, to solve the problem that you're trying to solve. You know, one of the things that we, we try to do is we try to be a member of the community, and thanks, George, for this opportunity to, to, to bring us into this, this situation where we can, we can try to, you know, kind of contribute back. Uh, we invest in a lot of the um, various different industry associations, uh, food banks and, and things like that. DigiBC, for example, which is the Digital Media Industry Association in Vancouver, their offices are actually inside our offices over on Great Northern Way, right next to the Center for Digital Media. So let's get into the case studies. Uh, I've got uh, kind of four points I'm going to bring up very quickly. Animation of VFX and how high-performance computing is, is being leveraged in that vertical. Then uh, I'm going to get into kind of the, the more Industry 4.0 stuff around digital visualization and variational, uh, uh, variational AI's platform, uh, which is currently being used to do uh, COVID therapeutic research. Um, so first of all, uh, uh, one of my favorites, uh, the, we are a public company, so we can only talk about uh, the, um, uh, the, the projects that we publicly announced. 
Uh, and luckily, we were able to publicly announce this one uh, back in December, uh, where we signed uh, Bardell Entertainment to do the render farm uh, for, for uh, Rick and Morty. Uh, I'm a big Rick and Morty fan, so I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. Uh, and what we did there uh, that's a little bit different is we adopted the new uh, AMD ROM chipset, and we were able to realize over the, over the latest and greatest you know, 8,000 8, series you know, platinum uh, CPUs from, from Xeon, uh, from, from Intel, sorry, uh, we were able to realize a 37% increase on a per core basis and almost a doubling increase in performance overall uh, against the, the previous system that, uh, that Bardell Entertainment was using. So that allowed their artists to, to iterate more, more quickly and be able to do more with what they had. The next thing is uh, the Learning Factory Digital Twin, which is in conjunction with UBC, and I'm, I'm happy to hear that UBC is joining us on the call today. Um, uh, the Learning Factory Digital Twin project is one of the first projects that was approved by the Supercluster, uh, and the idea behind that was to do a digital twin of, uh, of a factory, of, of, of a line, a product line within a factory uh, with, with both uh, Avcor and Boeing. Uh, and in that, we, we're using all, you know, it's a very flexible platform. We're using the latest and greatest in DGX uh, uh, GPU technologies right alongside various different types of C CPU loads and so on. So they are able to do full virtual reality visualization right along with simulation on, um, on uh, fluid dynamics within, within the, the um, ovens that they use. And I can't remember the proper name for those ovens, but anyway. Um, and the, uh, uh, alongside uh, Convergent, which is doing a bunch of simulation research on, on improving the composite uh, manufacturing process. So it, it's, it's a great project. It's only the POC of that project and, uh, and the Learning Factory Digital Twin project as a whole, the plan is to actually grow out uh, in an innovation district in, in the Okanagan uh, with UBCO. Uh, lastly, I'm going to talk about the variational AI platform we recently deployed. Uh, in this case, we're using GPUs to do AI research, and specifically, um, as was recently announced by Variational, they've received a, a supercluster uh, grant to do uh, COVID-19 therapeutic research. So they use AI to discover new molecules. In this case, they're actually repurposing their generative AI uh, algorithm to take existing drugs and determine what the best candidates are out of those existing drugs uh, uh, to test as possible therapeutics for, uh, for the critical stages of, of COVID-19. Uh, lastly, um, almost done here, I hope I'm, I'm under my 10 minutes, um, is that you know, this type of infrastructure is really the direction that computing is going. We talk about HPC with regards to research, we talk about HPC with regards to Industry 4.0, but when it comes to all of the things that are coming down the pipe, uh, if you're a big fan of Ready Player One and you, 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 you want to be able to go into the Oasis one day, if you want to have that virtual reality eSports experience, all of those things really require this low latency style of compute and they need HPC at the edge. And so this is the direction that computing, I believe, is going uh, and you know, it's, it's, our, it's our job to, to make that happen. Thanks very much. Perfect. I think at this point in a, in a normal a normal presentation, you get a round of applause and walk off stage. But, uh, <laughs> drop we'll just, the mic. <laughs> yeah, just drop the virtual mic. And we'll, so, uh, that's uh, very much appreciated, Anthony, and just some, uh, some very cool stuff you guys are working on. So let me, uh, let me take back, and uh, I will bring back my screen, and then that will allow me to... <coughs> now I'll go back on mute. Oh, yes. Perfect. Now let me, uh, give me the opportunity to introduce Roy. So uh, Roy and I have also been uh, working together and, and communicating on, on a number of levels for, for several, uh, several months. And uh, Roy has a, has a great background and, and what's more, uh, you know, uh, very nice person to work with, great guy, but also he is uh, thoroughly involved in a project that I think we can all get behind when, it, when you're talking about computing for the cure. And so um, a bit of background about, behind Roy. So um, he's the found, one of the founders of Cancer Compute, uh, a Canadian charity that is computing for the cure. As an executive IT professional with over 25 years experience, especially in AI, high performance computing and high performance data analysis. Uh, he served on multiple senior leadership roles in AI startups, Bombardier, uh, federal government, et cetera. So 
uh, a real titan uh, in the industry and obviously fighting uh, a very important battle. So uh, we're delighted to have Roy uh, as part of this uh, discussion and webinar today. So I will now, uh, my pleasure to, to introduce Roy and pass it over. Thank you very much, George. That's uh, quite an introduction. Um, I have to share my screen here now, and I think this is how I do it. I'll go back to the front. Okay, bear with me a moment, folks, as I get prepped here. All right, everybody can see that, I hope, George? Perfect, you're way to go. Okay, perfect. So yes, uh, thank you, um, uh, Anthony. Great presentation, by the way. Um, uh, cancer computer uh, has come into being, uh, we're about just over five years old now. Um, very interestingly, we were founded because uh, of uh, some of the things that George uh, um, went through in his slide about Compute Canada. Um, in 2015, uh, we, uh, we became aware of something called the Orion Report, which is written uh, by some of the folks here in, in Toronto and Ontario. Um, the research network there, and uh, they found that in the future, um, two things would be of, of great issue. One would be uh, the computing resources themselves, and then another one uh, would be uh, the, the necessity for high uh, quality personnel to be able to do all the work in terms of, uh, you know, uh, making sure the infrastructure is working okay, moving up to the workflow, uh, you know, where you interact the software with uh, the science, uh, and then, of course, uh, something we're trying to move up to, the, what we call the concierge layer, to you know, allow the researchers to focus more on the research and allow us to do some of that heavy lifting on the IT side to free them uh, and their resources to, to do uh, their research. So that's, that's kind, of, kind of the basics. So we've been in, in it for about five years. Uh, the model of, of Cancer Computer is basically, we go out there and we ask uh, some nice folks, uh, you know, like we got a, a million dollar donation of hardware from Ericsson. Uh, there's a, a company in town here that, gave, uh, that donated $150,000 worth roughly, uh, Ross Video. Um, we've recently got a donation um, uh, from the government of Canada via Computers for Schools. And we have about 420 servers there. Uh, those of you actually yet to be deployed. Um, so we're actually looking for uh, university partners. So if there's anyone uh, on there that uh, would like to contact me after, yes, we're looking for uh, some place to put these. So if you're interested in taking some slightly older gear, uh, we'd be interested in negotiating something with you uh, to, to assist your research. Um, so yeah, basically the mission of, of Cancer Computer is the cure for cancer. Um, you know, we believe that, you know, somewhere, you know, uh, you know, the, in computations, somebody's going to find something over time, we iterate and, you know, we, each year we're throwing lots of compute, helping those researchers with those core hours that are really important um, to do their work. Um, uh, one of our um, uh, advisors, uh, John Towns from the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, uh, he and I had this conversation and he, he focused on the idea that the core, like a core is the core. You can have a new core, brand new core, like those wonderful AMD cores that Anthony was talking about, and they'll do things really for you fast, but you might have a four or five year old Ivy Bridge core that you know, basically can do things you know, 70, 80, 90%, depending on the workload. Um, so the, our goal is to get some of these cores that would have went to you know, the waste dump uh, or elsewhere, we refurb the computers and then we, we get them out there. So um, again, we recognize that uh, you know there's there's issues with uh, getting grants for uh, compute time. There are uh, lag times in getting your um, the science lined up. Uh, there are issues around you know depending on the provider, like Compute Canada, you can run into issues where they give some batch uh, you know and you might not have experience, or you know someone who's assigned the work might not have that experience. They do a lot of testing and then they run it and it doesn't actually run the way they thought it would. Um, so there there are issues. So we try to we try to get in line there and say, hey, look, you know why don't you try your workloads with us? You know use us as your dev environment and then scale into Compute Canada. Or you know if you want to run a VM and you don't have access to it in your corporate infrastructure, run it in hours, you know, and then you can use MPI or open MPI and get into the, our infrastructure and prep for getting on Compute Canada or even your own campus cluster or your, your campus resources. 
Um, so we basically take these um, donations in. We will try to get other donations uh, from other partners. Uh, I just announced recently on LinkedIn, uh, one of our, our friends in uh, Toronto, DCR, they're a Dell partner, and they've gifted us almost 100 drives. So uh, we're going to take these enterprise drives and we'll, you know, we're going to build somebody a small, uh, you know, 25, 30 terabyte NAS that they can use for storage. Storage is always an issue. Um, and then we're going to use the other half of that donation for swap because we have a project at McGill for the neuroscience folks. Uh, we're going to be using those drives uh, to build a small cluster for them. They need to swap drives for uh, for, for their uh, OpenStack instance. So uh, that's kind of a model. We what we try to do is we try to go to host institutions. Mm -hmm. I'll get to a little bit of the business cases here. Um, typically, we have uh, three ways to do things. We can outright give a gift of hardware, and then we require, you know, um, an attestation that they're used on a certain type of research, and then we ask that, you know, we, we, we be informed of what that is and, you know, to be able to share it to the public. Um, the most popular one is uh, to allow us to do the management of the infrastructure and we gift up to a certain percentage, the majority to the host institution. And then we'll take a small um, percentage ourselves and we'll use it, uh, we'll build out the grid um, and we support uh, Exceed. We're an Exceed partner. That's the extreme science and engineering discovery environment in the United States. And then there's also something called the open science grid. So we support these projects and we'll run those, uh, you know, 100% all the time. And then uh, when the jobs are, you know, uh, changing over or we're not running 100%, we'll take uh, the remainder, uh, we'll, we'll scavenge into, um, you know, uh, jobs like Boink uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, here uh, is a job we, we support solely with scavenge workloads. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, up until COVID hit, we were, you know, generally third or fourth overall in the world in terms of support. We're still the number one, um, uh, institution or, or sorry, organization that supports uh, the University of Washington uh, uh, Institute for Protein Design uh, and the work they're doing right now on COVID. We're we're focusing everything we have on COVID, uh, but normally they, you know they do a lot of work that focuses on cancer or Alzheimer's and so on and so forth. So that's another uh, measure. And then there's um, you know why we're talking to folks like George is what we do is we there's two instances. One we'll collaborate with someone like George and we'll find funding if we can uh, and then we'll build up a cloud and we'll gift like freemium instances to universities so they can do you know small workloads or let's say at a departmental level if somebody can't get a grant or if there's a citizen scientist or if they're even students you know like uh, oftentimes uh, university might not have a lot of resources in the HPC space where we we, we, we like to support uh, stem so 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 that's another area as well so uh, co-location is very important to us um, and we have a number of ways we can we can meet it um, so uh, yeah so that's basically um, what we do I hope I'm okay on time here at four more minutes okay um, so basically this is a, an idea of how we acquire things we have a partnership with the government of Canada we have we're, we're building relationships we're talking to Dell right now uh, we're trying to work with their Dell financial services to work on getting things off lease um, uh, uh, and there are other companies that we're hoping, you know, Intel we're talking to, hoping to get some used uh, SSDs, processors, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is kind of our cycle of how we build. Our goal is to go from an infrastructure provider, like I said earlier, to that workflow layer, and then ultimately up into the concierge layer. I think we're still a couple of years away from that. We are talking to the federal government. There are a number of grants out there. Um, there are a couple of departments that really like the model that we're doing and they're looking at um, either helping us through an institution or, or granting us some money directly. Um, and if that's the case, we are looking to you, the research community, for uh, large research projects. Again, coming back to exactly what uh, George and Anthony were talking about, uh, that need for cores. So if there's really big projects you need uh, and you know, going to Amazon or somewhere else or even your own resources you don't have or Compute Canada, come to us. We might be able to find a way to, to, to meet that for you. So again, we're, we're 
computing for the core. We have our technical experts. We do outreach. Um, uh, we uh, also, like I said, we're working with the McGill Center for Neuroscience. Uh, we're happy to work with Dr. Evans. We have a few other things at McGill that we're standing up. I can't really talk about them yet, but uh, we're, we're developing a relationship there. So that's something we want to do uh, with all universities. You know, we start on these proof of concepts and we like to expand out and uh, we like to develop relationships at the researcher level. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, we're going to grow. Right now, we're, we're on target uh, this year for about 900 server deployments on 12 sites. Uh, and when I say we can support up to 1,700 researchers, what that means is we can support uh, up to 1,700 researchers from the 500, uh, sorry, from the 50,000 to 100,000 core hour per year project. So um, that's about it. Most of our um, deployment is in the United States, about 60%. We have about 40% here, but we do have a large tranche of gear uh, that we would like to deploy in Canada. It's from the government of Canada, so that's where we have to, to deploy it. As you can see, we're going to be scaling up and scaling out, and hopefully by 2022 to double our current footprint. Um, we're gonna, I'm definitely going to have a conversation with Anthony because we're looking to build some things in, into the edge, uh, doing solar, so on and so forth working into Asia and some developing countries in Africa. Um, here's our team. Uh, this is the core team. We also have uh, 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 some folks that are our advisors. Like I said, we have John Towns from the NCSA. Uh, Greg Newby has just joined us from, uh, he's the former CTO at uh, Compute Canada. We have Sean Brown. He was recently in McGill where we met him. Uh, and he's over at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center now. Uh, and we have a, you know, a few other uh, great folks, Tyler Nelson, um, hope I'm not missing anybody, but um, I'm trying to get through this quickly. I got another minute. So uh, yeah, that's us. I just briefly wanted to mention Cancer Computer is a Canadian charity. We do HPC for health research. Uh, we do free used hardware on-prem. So if the hardware is on your, on your prem, it's gifted to you for free. Um, we do freemium graphical VMs uh, in our co-locations and, and uh, things with Open Nebula and Open Cloud, uh, sorry, Open Stack. Uh, we do have a, a if you want to use our co-located services, we have, do have a price that's $95 per core year. Uh, we do a professional services on a cost recovery basis. So they're much cheaper, but we only do that in the space of health research, which we're allowed to do. I'm also a, the founder of Canada HPC. We're a brand new uh, federal corp. Uh, our job is, you know, we're going to be doing HPC across Canada. Uh, any HPC at all or high value workloads in AI or you know SAP, very large infrastructure clusters, we're, we hope to be your people to, to do this. Dell has brought us on as a partner. We'll be able to do that in Canada and the US. For example, we, you know, in this, uh, for using brand new gear, we have a, a, our per, per core year is $137. And then we can do professional services in a whole range. So that's about it. Please feel free to reach out in either context. Um, I'm very grateful, George, for the opportunity, and thank you very much. Perfect, Rory. Well, look, uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I think it's such a, a worthy cause and, and something that uh, I, we can all get behind. So, uh, yeah, congratulations on, on, on how far you've got today. And I hope today we can get some good interest from some of the institutions in, in working with you and, uh, and developing that further. Okay, so moving on, our final presenter uh, of today, and that's Mark Dam. And uh, uh, like Anthony and Roy, I've had the pleasure to work with Mark for, for, for some time now. Um, and, uh, and Mark and I have been developing a number of solutions in a number of different areas. But just to give you a, a little bit of background behind Mark, so he's a, a seasoned entrepreneur, uh, a, a highly technical expert and skilled system architect with over 25 years of experience. Uh, and I can attest to that and some of his knowledge base is, uh, is off the charts in, uh, in my opinion. Uh, Mark has worked with a range of Fortune 500 companies, uh, large public uh, agencies as well as uh, sectors, uh, uh, smaller sectors. Um, and so Mark is the founder, uh, chief executive officer and CTO of Fuse Forward. Uh, and he's responsible for leading uh, the vision and the strategy behind that. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, again, delighted to have Mark here today and, and really looking forward to uh, hearing how Mark and his team are working with, uh, with universities and institutions. Thanks, George. I am going to uh, share my screen here. 
and hopefully it's all good to go. Did it, uh, is it all showing properly? Uh, yes, it is. And can I just point out before you get on, and this is, uh, I, I'm going to take a lot of slack for this, but um, Q and A, uh, we obviously have a Q and A after this. Uh, if you have any significant questions, then please send them through. And, and we have had some already, so I will be bringing those up. Uh, but again, there is a little button at the below of the webinar that you can hit and you can drop some questions at any times. And, uh, you know, if you want to ping anybody with a tough question, then, uh, then Mark's your man. So, uh, so go for it. Appreciate it. So um, give you a little rundown uh, who Fuse Forward is, but really the, the meat of what I want to go and share with you today is, is more on what is the challenges of the universities and the research networks out there and how can you leverage both the hybrid cloud environments using the technologies that both Roy and Anthony have always shared, as well as those hyperscale cloud providers and, and what do they have to provide and what are some of the things that you need to consider when you're doing that? Things like CapEx expenditures, grants, and how do you leverage your grant funding in order to go and leverage all of this kind of money? How do you get more money from all of these different federal and provincial programs in order to keep the research programs underway? So let me, let me share a little bit, first off, just who I am and, and how the company has kind of come together and what we've done. Um, our marketing pitch is we make complexity simple with an automated IT systems and processes. Well, yeah, that, that sounds really good marketing speak, I think. But uh, at the end of the day, we've invented uh, a couple. We hold a number of patents around how to manufacture IT systems or any system like a water wastewater or an energy grid. Background that we grew up is being a large systems integrator, not just running infrastructure, but actually running and implementing big applications for universities, cities, clients like utility companies. And our, our past client base have included um, uh, City of Vancouver as an example, the City of Ottawa, Halton Region out of Toronto, York Region, and Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. So it's, it's all of that critical infrastructure areas where we have a lot of stuff. And the key thing that we found in all of these cases is they all are sh streaming significant amounts of data from SCADA systems. So these SCADA systems, everybody says that the world of IoT and streaming data is brand new. No, it's not. We've been doing this stuff since the uh, early 80s. And in fact, we've actually had SCADA systems working since the 60s. If you go back and start looking at analog devices. What we've got and what we currently operate today is an IoT platform. That's what we started with. Um, and what it's geared for is we initially started by deploying it on bare metal sitting in a data center using virtual servers. Then eventually it started to get to the point where it's becoming unwieldy and we needed the high resiliency provided by the mega provider. So it currently runs in AWS, but it's built in a model that can deploy on any single system. And some of the research that we have underway is all part of what we call the Intelligent Systems Research Network. And I'm gonna jump into that a little bit and just kind of share kind of what some of the things are and where we see the world going right now with respect to technology and, and the deployment models. And then similar to what Roy and Anthony have said is, what are those use cases that you're gonna see? And how are you gonna look at the new deployment models? Because it's not one of just, hey, what can we put in a data center? It's also what gear belongs on the edge, what gear belongs within the region, and what capabilities can you allow with the hyperscale providers that have not just, not necessarily the, infra well, they have lots of infrastructure, but they also have software and development environments and application development environments, which are of highly valuable use for researchers out there as well. So we have the intelligent, we, we founded the, the Intelligent Systems Research Network, and this has been going for about seven years now. And the whole model behind this is we provide funding. So what we've been doing is sponsoring projects with the university labs where it's all part of a cohesive strategy of enabling intelligent devices in the field, cross domain. So as an example, we started out by doing real time water streaming analytics. We actually dug up part of a city. We put in some district flow meters. We isolated a neighborhood and we tried to figure out if we could follow all the water leaks and determine water usage patterns using smart meters. Guess what? We can. Um, 
we then went through and said, hey, utilities, do you guys want to use this? They said, no, we don't have all the smart metering infrastructure. So we sat here and said, well, we've done all this great technology. What else can we apply it to? And what else can we do to engage the other universities? So we started working with the colleges. We did some work with Mohawk College um, and we did a few little demonstration projects there in the way of simulators. That was way back in 2010, 2011. What we've now got and where we are now is we've engaged and we just started off in January, the continuation of a multi-year project with Ryerson University and, and the downtown campus in Toronto is now the foundation for a smart campus digital twin. But how is that gonna transpire? Well, part of what we see with intelligent systems is that we plug in all of these real-time controls, building information systems, all of these little drones that are flying along and getting reading information, as well as point of sale data and other types of things that can come in from campus stores. And when you start looking at all of that, you start saying, well, what can we make sense of and how do we normalize the data sets? How do we anonymize the data sets? How do we manage the privacy? How do we structure and secure it all? And how do we process part of the ML and AI algorithms that may be generated in the central environment but then process them in regions and then actually have automated control within buildings. That's, the, that's part of the foundation of, this, of the research ongoing right now. That's part of the digital twin. We've got other things that are going on related to that, which are smaller components, which are things like, how do we calculate indicators in stream? So let's say we've got a medical device. I mean, I have one right here. It's called my watch, okay? And what that medical device is doing is it shows my sleep patterns, my, my heart rate and everything else. But let's say I wanna go through and compare that last year and I wanna say, am I out of the norm? Is, is things starting to bubble up? You're gonna start needing more and more processing capabilities to go through and process that. And that becomes the need, as, as Anthony was indicating, it becomes things that you're gonna to have to start processing in region in order to be able to ingest streaming data sets that are coming on within a region or a city. The other thing, one of the other things we do right now is we actually have some real life cusp, uh, projects going on too, which is um, if you're familiar with bicycle rental networks in the various cities, the largest one in the world is actually the city of London in the UK. They've got 25,000 bikes, they've got 12,000 stations, and they move those bikes around every, every few minutes to make sure that availability is in place at the train stations so that when people are coming in, they can take the bike, ride it home, and then trucks go around and move them back in. Well, that's all managed using dynamic dispatching systems and doing machine learning using time of day, train schedules, weather patterns, usage patterns. We run all of that. It's all being done today. So it's a live case study of not just the power of what we're talking about in streaming analytics and in things like digital twins that researchers are working on, but it becomes a real world case study with real live data that's showing us the needs and the, and the challenges. So it works within a small environment, but let's take a bike. Bikes are simple when you've got, got 25,000 of them and you're moving it around a big city like London. But what if we start now doing autonomous vehicles and we're starting to drive those around? The amount of horsepower and high performance computing capabilities that we need within a city environment that are able to process all of the different devices, vehicles moving around, people moving around. We overlay that with our, with our two meter distribution of people for COVID rules. And all of a sudden there's a big challenge of data sets to try and manage and things that we're gonna start seeing in the way of quote unquote, the new normal. So all kinds of problems now. And, and the big thing is, is that researchers out in all the universities are working on different domain sets. We have a number of our researchers going right now, and one of the key things we found is that they're actually using their, their laptop computers to process. But here are some of the cloud research use cases that you can look at. One, how do we share data sets between different organizations? So if you've got a group, a Mars Innovation out of Toronto, we got the digital supercluster out west here, but they wanna share anonymized medical data. How do we do that? We can do that in the cloud. What about computer clusters on demand? Well, in all cases here, having clusters of high performance computing, once it's available and you put, uh, you put a layer of management on top, you can dynamically leverage that. All right, what are the other things that we're starting to see? Reliable backups, maintaining the latest infrastructure and all those new CPUs and GPUs. And then of course, virtual teams and how to collaborate with researchers around the world and sharing all the data between all those different sites. 
So those are some of the research use cases that we're seeing. Some of the other things that we have to take into consideration in the university world is, how do you leverage hybrid? Compute Canada, George, fantastic on providing those specs that they don't have enough capacity. But if we augment that capacity with what's in the cloud, plus what's in these high performance regional nodes, the capacity is available, but it's provided by different alternative organizations like Roy's uh, group, Cancer Compute, which is coming up with innovative approaches for providing compute capacity. We still have to be considerate of data residency. They have to be Canadian based. So we have to be dropping them into data centers in Canada. And then the other part that we've currently deployed is we run a virtual private lab in Amazon in Montreal, but it is locked down. We're currently doing government based. It's, it's, uh, it's, class, it's, it's able to handle what they call B classifications of data. And that's all available now in order to go through and manage the virtual labs and provide that virtual lab environment. So those are, I'm trying to give you a little bit of some case studies, a little bit of where you can go through and leverage, uh, leverage the cloud in the way of use cases, as well as give you a little bit of things to consider with respect to how the researchers in Canada could basically leverage both cloud, both the hybrid environments where it's based upon physical gear in a data center, as well as the hyper providers that are based in Montreal. Now, a little question that always there, we, we've actually prepared a white paper for the universities and researchers, and, it, and it's all geared towards strategies of leveraging grant money. CFI money, as an example, is all geared towards buying and procuring capital assets. And if you can't attach it to a capital asset, you can't use it for OPEX spend. Well, how do you do that? Where, where you want to go through a leverage uh, operating expense or even a subscription-based model, how can you convert that into a CapEx? We have a white paper you can go to our website and find us all about converting your, OPEC, your, your CapEx and your grant money and being able to use it to buy an OPEX usage, i.e. subscription-based services over a term. So we basically couple together a hybrid environment where it incorporates not only what would be in a physical data center on gear that is part of a CapEx, but it has capabilities and burstability into the public cloud providers to leverage some of the tooling environments like their machine learning and AI tools as part of an integrated environment to go through and help do that. So again, funding available, happy to go and share our experience to those um, and anybody's got questions around that. And I just wanna wrap it up and hand it back to George and so that we have enough time for some questions and comments uh, back to the crowd as we go forward here. Thank you for your time. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mark. That's uh, yeah, extremely interesting in some of the work you've been doing with the institution. So it is Q&A time, and uh, I do have some questions for, uh, for our panelists. So I'll ask our panelists all to uh, unmute themselves. Uh, unfortunately, we only have five minutes left, and I think that's indicative of getting four founders and CEOs in one virtual room together, because... Uh, Oh, yeah. Who doesn't like to talk about their own, uh, their own products? So anyway, regardless of that, I would like to, uh, to bring on uh, a couple of questions for everybody. Uh, before, before I do, though, I'll leave this screen up there. Um, we'll be sharing the slides. Uh, if you want to contact me and go and get in contact with any of the uh, personnel of the panel, panelists today, then please contact me and I'll pass that on and we can, we can set something up. Uh, but to start off with a question, uh, I'm going I'm to head straight back to you, Mark. Um, security. I mean, how, I mean, how, and, and literally you have a minute, so I'll, I'll give you a minute, but how secure, you know, is the cloud? I mean, are, are we talking, I mean, we're talking about keeping your data in, in Canada, so you've got to go all the way to the, the East Coast and Montreal if you want to use AWS. You know, what are the implications here? And, and can institutions feel fairly confident about what they're, what they're doing in the cloud? So um, it's already gone through. All the cloud providers have had to go through security assessments with the federal government already. And so they've gone through that over the last 12 months and they've all been certified last year in the fall um, for up to, up to protected B status of all of their data and even higher in some respects. So is it secure? Well, I would say yes. Uh, we actually are doing a demonstration project with DND right now, specifically geared towards providing a secure environment for running uh, data and human resources data. It all comes down to shared responsibility. Do you need firewalls? Yes. Do you need to go through and provide private network connections if required? Yes. 
Can you tap into something like BCNet and have BCNet backhauled into those environments? Well, as much as you can go through and leverage private networks, you can manage the security layer and also manage and privilege user access to that. But I would say, yes, it is secure, it's, but it does come with a certain level of responsibility with the users and the end users of the application as well. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much for that. And again, uh, a very hot topic, but uh, one that I think you're, uh, you've got a good handle on. Uh, Anthony, over to you. And I can see you and I are both rocking our, our COVID-19 haircuts. So, uh, you know, we have that compatibility going on here. Um, but, uh, you know, high performance compute in the cloud, you know, I mean, really, the cloud players are putting a huge amount of money into, into implementing high performance compute. How can your solution be that much better than, than, than the cloud uh, solutions out there? Uh, can you talk me through that a little bit more? Um, I can try it. Can you hear me okay? Because I'm actually having trouble hearing you. Um, yeah. yeah, all right. So good. Um, uh, I, just to reframe the question, just to make sure I heard it correctly. I don't know what's going on with my, with my uh, headset here, but um, uh, you know, kind of what is, what is the difference between high performance compute and the cloud? How do you leverage high performance compute uh, in the cloud as, 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 uh, as kind of what we're proposing and, and, you know, kind of, how do you how do you characterize that? Is that is that basically the question? Yeah, uh, yeah, basically. Okay. Um, well, I mean, you know, I, I, the idea around uh, elasticity and being able to use um, uh, cloud resources and 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 being able to move in that opex direction, which, by the way, I'm very interested in that white paper, Mark. I'd like to I definitely want to want to take a look at that. Um, uh, and and by the way, Roy, I have a couple of uh, of blade servers for you. So uh, follow up with me. Uh, I've got uh, I've got some some nice blade servers that that just came off of a, of, a, of a render farm and uh, they're looking for a home. Yeah, so the, great the, thank you, Anthony. <laughs> the uh, um, uh, the difference with with the with kind of what we do and what what is is done uh, in the hyperscalers and the big cloud environments uh, is is twofold. One is the elasticity. How do I be able to? How can I get? Um, uh, elasticity in my into my job. You know, I, I need to I need to run a, a a research job, but I only need to run it for so long. I don't want to procure all this capital equipment. I don't want to go out and try and build something, or even or even have somebody run something for me that I'm then on the hook for forever. When really this is a uh, a research project that has a, a finite end to it, uh, and I and I need this. I need as much compute capacity as I can get for the period of time in which I need it. Uh, and you know. That's, that's the, the, the main difference for me. It's not so much around the technology itself and how we deal with the technology. We can apply OpenStack virtualization and, and mitigate latency and give true high performance computing performance to an end user um, uh, without having to you know, do anything uh, special from what, we, from what we already do with regards to, to HPC uh, and, and giving HPC in the cloud. So the challenge is, is being able to have enough requirement for HPC style compute uh, uh, in a virtualized ad hoc environment. Uh, and, and that is what we're seeing. Just based on the growth and the amount of work that needs to be done out there on these types of, of processing jobs, we're seeing enough load uh, to be able to enable elastic access to high performance computing uh, and being able to to do those jobs and then and then move on to uh, you know move on to other more up to date you know whatever the latest um, requirement is for that researcher uh, and so I think that 's kind of the future that we 're going to see here is the kind of coming together of the elasticity along with the performance of hpc okay well, thank you very much for that uh, that good explanation uh, we we 've sort of run out of time, but before we go, I just want to give a little bit of time for uh, you know, maybe uh, 30 seconds, Roy, just to give what your expansion plans are in Canada. What, what, what would you like to see for Cancer Compute over the next uh, six to 12 months? Uh, well, it's actually very interesting. Uh, Anthony touched uh, on a project we're actually working on. It's, it's, uh, it has to do with elasticity. So uh, we, were, we were looking to build out some uh, local deployments uh, with some partners, and then uh, we're building a large proof of concept uh, with a fair amount of donated equipment to um, uh, share um, these resources amongst uh, universities and open science initiatives. That's one of our big ones. Um, and uh, we're looking to deploy these 420 servers. So again, if there are any 
uh, partner institutions out there or would like to be a partner institution, uh, please contact myself or George. I'd be very grateful and I don't want to keep everybody. So please stay safe in this COVID reality. Uh, I'm rocking my COVID haircut too. And uh, <laughs> thank you again, everyone and George uh, for hosting uh, us all today. Yeah, love it. Well, we're, we're, we're lucky enough to have Mark zoom in from his Caribbean beach. Or, uh, or it, it might, I like my it might COVID be haircut too. It keeps me nice and clean. Yeah, exactly. Perfect, perfect. Well, look, again, a huge thank you uh, to the panelists for being here today and spending the time putting this together and, and your teams, because there's a lot of people that go behind what you do and, and how you put this all together. So a big thank you to all of them. And of course, uh, a big thank you to all our attendees who could make it today. We, we hit 53 attendees at one point. So um, that's, uh, that's basically around 80% of everybody who registered. So I'm, I'm, I'm hugely delighted with that number and, and thanks very much everybody for being here. So um, again, uh, as, uh, as Roy mentioned, stay safe and uh, please contact me if you'd like to follow up with everybody on, the, on this. Thanks again.